City Council meeting. We'll go ahead and open our meeting. Um, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance, and uh, Adam will lead us in that. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Agenda this evening is a proclamation that uh, I would like to present, and this proclamation is dealing with Small Business Saturday, and we have uh, asked a couple of individuals to be a part of this with me. Come down, uh, Jody and Jenny, representing MDA, and anyone else from the MDA or. Oh, excuse me. Okay. <laughs> Welcome. Well, let me go ahead and read this proclamation. Whereas the city of McMinnville celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions they make to our local economy and community, accordingly, according to the United States Small Business Administration, there are currently... 28.8 million small businesses in the United States that represent 99.7% of all businesses with employees in the United States and are responsible for 63% of net new jobs created over the past 20 years. And whereas small business employs 48% of the employees in the pri private sector in the United States, and whereas on average 33% of consumers' holidays shopping will be done at small independently owned retailers and restaurants. And whereas 91% of all consumers believe that supporting small independently owned uh, uh, restaurants and bars is important. And whereas 76% of all consumers plan to go on uh, to go to one or more small businesses as part of their holiday shopping. And whereas the city of McMinnville supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost local economy and preserve our neighborhoods. And whereas advocacy groups as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday, now, therefore, I, Scott A. Hill, mayor of the city of McMinnville, do hereby proclaim November 25th, 
2017 as Small Business Saturday and urge the residents of our community and communities across the country to support all businesses and, and merchants on Small Business Saturday and throughout the year. It witness I have here to set my hand and cause the official seal of the city of McMinnville to be attached to this the 14th day of November 2017. Scott A. Hill Mayor. So, proclamation to small businesses. Thank you. Why don't we have individuals representing to introduce themselves? Jenny Berg, and tonight I'm wearing my McMinnville Downtown Association Board President hat. I'm Jamie Korf, and I'm the Events and Promotions Manager with the McMinnville Downtown Association. I would like to say a few things if it's all right. We are celebrating Small Business Saturday on November 25th, as Mayor Hill said. And I'd like to invite any businesses that are downtown, members, non-members alike, to let me know what promotions they will be holding on Small Business Saturday, and I would love to promote them. Um, Holly Ann here from Accessory Appeal and Found Objects, as well as Stephanie, are a big part of organizing Small Business Saturday. And they have done a lot of their legwork around that, so they are also good people to contact. And then I would also like to present our council members with Small Business Saturday bags and swag inside. I think there's one special one for the mayor with a banner in it. It's either... Oh, I apologize. <laughs> that was a lot lighter than I thought it would be. That's the banner. Here we go. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. And I would also like to invite all of our city leaders to go shop downtown on Small Business Saturday. If you're into taking selfies, take a selfie. Hashtag stroll Mac. Just to let everybody know that you're shopping downtown. And also community members, too. Hashtag Stroll Mac. Yay! Oh, I don't, I don't think these two want to talk. <laughs> Again, thank you so very much. Thank um, you. I know McMinnville has a strong history of supporting no. local businesses downtown and to be able to focus on a particular day, uh, which is a fun shopping day, isn't it? So, um, again, thank you, and it was our pleasure to be able to provide the proclamation. So, thank you, Mayor. And then so we'll was a dangerous item to include. <laughs> well, I forgot to tell you, you give the council a bag of goodies and we may lose them for the rest of the evening. <laughs> well, again, thank you for that. Um, what this uh, brings us up to right now is our... our uh, public com uh, comment section and um, this evening uh, we will ask anyone who has a topic other than a topic that's already on the agenda, a matter in litigation or quasi-judicial land use matter, a matter uh, scheduled for a public hearing at some future date. Um, we're going to limit the comments to five minutes this evening. Um, also, I just want to let you know if anyone's here to comment on the discussion we're going to have a little later dealing with the fees um, uh, for transporting um, our garbage out of the community. Um, that is going to, we're going to have a public hearing on that. So we would ask you to hold those comments uh, till we, when we have our public hearing. And my understanding is that will be in two weeks that we have that public hearing. So with that being said, um, I have Donnie Madsen, if you'd come up and... Mason. Or excuse me, Mason. My first time here. Sit here. Sit here and uh, just to introduce yourself, and uh, and then we'll give you five minutes to uh, share your comments, Donnie. Thank, thank you. Um, I'm Donnie Mason. Um, I'm a Mainville resident. Uh, I've 
I have some information I'd like to enter into the public. Why don't record. you bring the, uh, the mic a little closer to you, okay. Donnie? Thank you. I have some information I'd like to enter into the public record. It's in the form of a book that I wrote. It's entitled Screwed, Blued, Tattooed, and Sold Down the River. It's an American political saga, remedies included, some assembly required. And um, first, I'd like to thank you all for your, for your service. I know you a little bit better than you know me because I was able to go online and look at the McMinnville um, website and, and see your information. So thank you for your, for your service. Um, appreciate that very much. Um, the information that I have that's in this book, um, as my father would say, um, even a blind hog comes across an uh, acorn once in a while. And um, so I went rooting off the, the beaten path about 30 years ago and uh, gathered information and, and had a number of political activities, but I couldn't let it pass. I didn't really want to be here tonight. I'd rather be recovering from um, salmon fishing on the Little and the stuck in a drift boat. <laughs> but this is information uh, I think uh, you can appreciate and use. And myself, a little bit about myself. I was born in Arkansas, raised in the Central Valley, California. My parents were sharecroppers in Arkansas, ranch hands in California. Graduated high school in 64, uh, joined the Air Force in 66 with my twin brother. Um, we were mechanics on the SR-71, one of which we have at the Evergreen out here. <clears throat> and when I was in boot camp, um, uh, going through the process shots and and interviews of uh, was being interviewed name uh, address you know previous address religion and uh, I said Mennonite and he looked up and he said Mennonite I said, I said yeah he says what's that I said well it's a Christian religion and he says was it is it like Presbyterian I says well it's Christian like Presbyterian so he said Presbyterian so that's what's on my dog was on my dog tag <laughs> but I was baptized in Mennonite. But anyways, um, um, in 87, I got my paralegal uh, certificate. And, uh, this last month, my wife and I were married 50 years. And I was telling a friend that, and he, I said, I must have done something really good in a previous life. And he says, well, maybe Linda did something really bad in a previous life. <laughs> and I said, well, you, you got a point there. But anyways, I'd like to leave you a couple of copies of this. I appreciate you taking a look at it. I stopped by the library on the way over tonight and dropped off a copy there, so it's available at the library. And I um, appreciate the time. Oh, Adam, uh, uh, I see that you served on the fire department. Uh, I was a volunteer paid on call. I did that for a little over five years. So when I say go get a Pulaski, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Donnie. And it, again, it was good to have you come in front of us and uh, feel free to come in anytime you'd like. And if you want to leave those with our city record. I will. Thank you very much. Okay, next we have uh, Mark Davis and we talked a little bit, Mark, uh, about the public hearing, but anything outside those parameters, feel free. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mark Davis, 652 Southeast Washington Street. I want to talk about recology, but not anything about what's going to be a, a subject of the hearing. I want to talk about the information that I'd like the council to ask recology for so that we'll ha make a better decision or have more information to make a better decision if we do have that hearing. And I, and I want to be clear that these comments are not intended to be critical of recology or just because I'm asking for more information that I'm suspicious of them or anything like that. I met Mr. Peters at the, the zero waste meeting. I think he's a real upstanding guy and I don't have any problem with recology. It's just like, you know, the, the city goes through an audit. It isn't because you distrust your, your finance staff. It's because it's the thing to do and, and ask for information. So the first thing I'd like to bring to your attention in the, uh, Franchise agreement is on page 13. Let's see, this is like 1F. Um, and I'll just read it. When 
when the franchise, where the franchisee shares management and general administrative, general and administrative resources, which is affiliates, in lieu of the allocation method, the franchisee and the city agree that the charges for such services shall be determined as a, as a percentage of gross revenues, which may be adjusted by mutual agreement between the city and the franchisee. Charges for these services shall be equal to or less than 80% of the cost of procuring such services from third party service providers. I know that's a lot of legalese, but basically it's talking about the, the um, general and administrative costs. If you've looked at the financial statements that you got last June from, uh, um, from uh, Recology, that's a significantly large number. And I really think it's worthwhile asking for some you know, verification and backup of, that that is in fact what's going on. Um, related to that, if you looked in that, in that uh, review that was provided to you in June, there was $4 million in related party transactions. That was note five of the financial statements. Um, you know, to me, that suggests at least there's the potential for, you know, allocations to be going on that we don't know what exactly is going on between the, the the different affiliated organizations. And I think the public, you know, deserves a right to see what, what exactly these allocations are. Um, in uh, part 6A, or 6-1-A, I'm sorry, page 10 of the franchise agreement in the determination of rates. Um, this is just kind of a curiosity thing that, that I have. It says revenues include, quote, revenue from the sale of recycled material. Um, but I don't see that line item in the, the 617 approved rate sheet, nor in the, um, the, the reviewed financial statements that were provided. I know talking to Mr. Peters that they definitely are getting revenue from the, the recycled items. And I, and I realize that's something that goes up and down. It seems like it ought to be something of concern to us because, you know, we, we want to know exactly, you know, we're, we're trying to do more of recycling. Are we going to get more money from recycling or, or what's going to happen? So it would be interesting to, I think, to have a little more information about that before we decide on, on the rate increase. I mean, the recycling expense in uh, the, the rate proposal is $420,000. So it's, you know, obviously there's a lot of expense there. I don't know how much revenue, if any, that we're getting in. Um, and then in rep information that the, the council can request, and this is uh, Article 7 reports. Um, uh, <clears throat> The required financial statements for franchisee for the preceding year with mutually agreed schedules prepared by the franchise to provide backup for any allocated expenses. The franchise will also identify any expense incurred with an affiliated company. The city's request franchisees shall provide such backup as is reasonable to verify that such expenses was equal to or less than that which would have been incurred by a non-affiliated company. So I think that's another thing that would be worthwhile for the council to ask uh, Recology for is, you know, since there's a, a lot of this affiliated stuff going on, let's, let's see what those numbers are and, you know, are they reasonable? Um, you know, in conclusion, I just want to say, I know you all come from, you know, different uh, business backgrounds. Um, you know, there's not one bank in town, you know, there's not one home builder, there's not one CPA, there, you know, more than one person come in, but there's only one garbage service provider in this community. And that's because of this franchise agreement that I was just quoting from. And so I think it's important that we have a, a full open discussion of what these numbers are and what they mean to the community before we, you know, proceed to approve any sort of rate increase. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And now if I learn how to get rid of this. Oh, turn it to the top. Thank you, David. You know, I've been carrying this for 20 years, you know, in some form or fashion, and it works really well. My son. <laughs> Again, Mark, thank you. Uh, JW. <clears throat> Welcome. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, JW Milligan, 624 Northeast 2nd Avenue, 2nd Street. Mayor Hill and members of the council, before I get on topic, I have to make a slight side trip. First, don't believe what you read in the paper. <laughs> Jeb has a personal agenda, and it's not the truth. 
and it's not for the benefit of the McMinnville community. Just wanted to make that statement. Um, what I believe the process used to grant free money to the Atticus Hotel was not transparent and that the waived system development charges in the sum of 100,000 were never discussed publicly. But that is in the past. Now we're dealing with review criteria for $20,000 of grant money for the next five years. First, there should have been a public notice of the detailed review criteria adopted by the Urban Renewal Board. This was not done. I was not noticed, as promised by this council, that I would be, nor the special notice sent to the public. I need you to reopen the hearing on the review criteria. This criteria needs to be transparent, measurable, and public. Second, I would suggest some changes to the criteria. First, that the definition of full-time jobs in the criteria should be specific and defined explicitly under standard FTE requirements as 35 to 40 hours per week. Two, that jobs at the Odd Fellows building not be included in the job count. The Odd Fellows building was pre-existing and received a separate $100,000 grant of free county lottery money, which was supposed to create jobs. Despite this specific requirement, pre-existing jobs were actually displaced by construction of a public conference room, exercise room, bathroom, and office for the Atticus. At least three or four jobs left the building when the previous tenants, when, during the construction. Given that there may be only one or two full-time equivalent jobs generated by the conversion of the Odd Fellows space, it seems that reconfiguration may have actually resulted in a net loss of jobs. To be clear, I have never opposed the Atticus Hotel project, just the lack of transparency surrounding its use of public money. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you, JW. Thank you. Appreciate it. And we have Ramsey McPhillips. Ramsey, if you'd come up and Again, I, I saw that you came in a little late. We're not taking any testimony on uh, the things that may be a part of the public hearing that we'll have discussed later. Right, I did come prepared for that, but I'll set that aside. Great, thank you. Andy. So I just wanted to update you really quickly on the status of the um, landfills um, expansion. Yesterday, you probably were aware we had a, a hearing in front of the Supreme Court. Um, we were represented in amica briefs from the Department of Justice, the Farm Bureau, a thousand friends of Oregon, and uh, certainly um, Stop the Dump Coalition. It went very, very well. You never know what the judges are going to do. They apparently take a great deal of time to decide, which means that the landfill will remain um, stalled in terms of the large expansion. There's two potential expansion um, issues going on right now. One we call the vertical expansion, which is the long range 29 acres. And then there is the horizontal, which is putting garbage in a stopgap effort, um, temporarily 400,000 tons on the old footprint. We've challenged both of those expansions. And I just wanted to pose a warning which I'm doing to everyone, not just to this council. We are actively pursuing the legal remedies to stop both of those vertical and horizontal expansions. Meaning that A, there may not be a place for McMinnville to send the garbage regardless of what you decide in a couple weeks. And B, if garbage is placed on the landfill, we'll be asking for it to be removed, which is our legal right. The DEQ, and presumably waste management are gonna go forward even though there are pending legal questions relating to both of these expansions. They can't go forward with a large expansion, but they may go forward with a short expansion. We are gonna challenge them. And given yesterday's very positive as the reporter for the Capitol Press said vibe from the justices, we think we have a good chance to um, have uh, positive results in the courts. So, your garbage may be included in garbage that goes into Riverbend Landfill that will be asking legally to be removed and you will be culpable for that. And believe me, you know me, 
the smiley nice guy with a bunch of baby animals, but when it comes to my legacy, I will pursue it to every degree. So um, please be noted, you're on notice, that um, I, I ask you not to get involved in this legal quagmire and just move on to another less conflicted disposal system. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks with lots of details. Thank you, Ramsey. Do you have any questions about the hearings? This is your chance. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our public comments this evening. That will take us to our next item of business, which is a presentation. And this presentation comes from our Historic Landmark Committee. And our committees are going to be coming before council on an annual basis now to uh, at least annually uh, to report to the council on um, the things that have been happening within that committee work. And it's a, a great way for us to recognize those committees and the committee work that's been going on. And so uh, representing the Historic Landmark uh, Committee, we've got uh, Chuck and then Joan Rabkin to, to make a presentation. So I'll ask the two of you to come up and we're looking forward to your report. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Um, so I'm Chuck Darnell. I staff the Historic Landmarks Committee for the Planning Department. Um, Joan Drapkin's here as well. She's our chair of the Historic Landmarks Committee. Um, so just for a little bit of background on what the Historic Landmarks Committee does, in case everyone's not familiar, um, their role is basically to administer and manage the city's historic preservation program. Um, they serve an advisory role to city council, and they're also a decision-making body on some types of land use applications uh, related to um, the downtown area and historic resources throughout the city. Um, specifically, some of their responsibilities include managing the, uh, the local historic resources inventory, which is our list of all the um, historic resources in the city that are that have been deemed as significant or uh, distinctive. That list includes over 500, um, probably somewhere around 300 are, are higher tiers that are protected uh, by the city. Um, the, the Historic Landmarks Committee will review any proposed alterations to those historic resources. There's uh, design guidelines and standards that those things are subject to. Uh, the committee is also responsible for doing surveys and studies of the city um, in terms of historic resources and uh, historic districts. And also just to raise public awareness of historic resources is another one of the committee's role. Um, so doing any types of public engagement, um, sharing information about historic things in the city. Um, so our current Historic Landmarks Committee is made up of, uh, well, currently we have four members in one vacant position. Normally there is five. Um, Joan is our chair. She's been on the committee for quite a long time. Um, John Mead, who's a, who's a founder of a local construction uh, company here in McMinnville. Mary Beth Branch, who has a background in architecture, um, and she was actually involved with the photo you see, the um, listing of the Buchanan Cellars on the um, uh, National Register. She was involved in that process. And Corey Schott, who is um, he's actually an adjunct professor at the University of Arizona and has a background in history. So we have a really diverse background and a lot of different expertise on our committee right now. Um, so it's a, it's a very good group. Um, late in 2016, the committee started to meet more frequently again. It had been a few years since they really had any specific projects and met on a regular basis. Um, so we started doing that and they adopted a work plan for the coming years, um, which is shown here. And I'll kind of go through a little bit more detail in it uh, through my presentation. Um, so in 2017, then, like I said, we, we established a monthly meeting. Um, so we meet on the fourth Wednesday of every month at the Community Development Center at 3 p.m. Um, it's a public meeting, so anyone's invited to attend that. Um, so at, as of at the end of 2017, we will have had 12, or sorry, 10 meetings in 2017, which is uh, quite a few and we were able to get quite a bit of work done. Um, the HLC helped and from the work plan, we developed a um, grant application and we were successful in getting a $12,000 grant to do some work over the next year. Um, we also developed an RFP for, the, for that work to be completed and I'll touch on that again here in a little bit. 
Um, one other thing we did was we revisited some of our older surveys. We have some um, the historic resources inventory and there was some other um, historic surveys that were completed. And we looked at some of that information and tried to focus in on an area where the next survey we're going to be doing uh, will be focused. And we've narrowed it down to two areas, uh, residential areas north and south of downtown. Um, so we'll st we're still uh, refining that, but that's uh, something that we worked on a little bit last year. Um, the HLC also spent quite a bit of time updating the city's historic, uh, historic preservation regulations. If you all remember, those uh, came to, to you as the city council and you adopted the new um, historic preservation chapter and the zoning ordinance. Um, the HLC met for probably, I think it was six or eight um, meetings, public meetings, where they reviewed, uh, updated uh, Oregon revised statutes and proposed amendments to the code. And those eventually worked their way through the process, um, but they were very heavily involved in that. Um, and they also, over the course of the last year, reviewed five land use applications. Um, so some of the types of things they'll do are um, downtown design review. Uh, they reviewed the Atticus Hotel and its exterior design primarily to make sure it fit in with the, with the downtown and the historic buildings in that area. Um, they did a historic resource classification. Uh, this was a, a home that was actually moved from the Winfield campus to an area in southwest uh, McMinnville. And so they reviewed that um, proposal. Um, and they also reviewed a request to designate a sign as a historic resource. Uh, in the past year, it was the Farnham Electric sign, which um, is out on Lafayette Avenue now, but it's uh, the sign has existed for since, I think, the 1930s and was in its um, original location on 3rd Street. And some of these photos here you can see. So there's some of the types of applications that, they'll, uh, that the HLC will work on. Um, upcoming in 2018, the two of the biggest undertakings we'll be doing are um, going to be the intensive level survey and a historic preservation plan. Um, those are the two things that we are going to be completing with the grant funds that we received. Um, the intensive level survey is going to focus in on one of those two areas that I mentioned before, and it'll include six to 12 properties, and it'll be in-depth research on, on those properties, and it'll allow us to update our local inventory. Um, and have more information on some of those historic resources. And then uh, a historic preservation plan will be created. Uh, this is going to kind of help guide historic preservation in the city. Um, currently, our comprehensive plan has goals and policies related to historic preservation, but it was really more about, at the time, um, establishing the program for the first time. So we obviously have had it now underway for a while. Uh, we'll be looking at the program, and uh, the plan will help with some implementation plan and policies and um, guidelines moving forward for how that program continues here. Um, we have uh, worked with Northwest Vernacular Historic Preservation. They were the consultant that we selected um, from the um, RFP that was completed. And they're based out of Washington, and they'll be completing the work for us. Um, just some other activities. These are all things that were on the work plan. Uh, National Preservation Month will be in May of 2018, so we'll be involved in promoting that. Um, we've talked about establishing a historic preservation award program and kind of tying that in with historic preservation month, month to try and raise awareness of people in town that are doing good work and doing um, preservation of their old historic buildings. And so um, we're hoping to bring those awards back and present them at council during his historic preservation month. Um, we'll, we'll be developing a walking tour brochure similar, similar to the downtown one for another area, um, likely the area where we choose the intensive level survey. Um, potentially looking at historic districts and then also looking at some uh, other zoning text amendments to preserve, better preserve existing historic resources around the downtown. Um, just other events that will be going on in 2018. As part of the historic preservation plan, we'll have a couple of public meetings. Uh, those are tentative for February and June. So those are going to be open to the public and the council's welcome to attend. Um, at the end of that process, there will be a plan that will be completed. Um, the historic landmarks committee will review that throughout the development of it and eventually um, recommend it to council for consideration and for adoption. And that should be sometime in late 2018. Um, part of Preservation Month, we're hoping to kick off the McMinnville This Place Matters campaign and to, to, to promote some historic landmarks here in the city. Um, so you can look for that in the month of May. And like I mentioned, the Historic Preservation Awards as well. Um, so we'll turn it over to Joan, and she's got 
wants to give a little update and then we'll, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. Mr. Mayor and City Council, I'm happy to be here before you and want to thank you for the fine work you've done. Um, uh, Mr. Darnell has given really a full report, so I'll be very brief in my comments. I just want to compliment you and the city planning department on a job well done. I'm very impressed with the staff and director, Heather Richards <coughs> and Chuck Darnell, whom I have the most contact. They are energetic, thoughtful, and hardworking. Our monthly meetings are disciplined. The staff reports sent out before, beforehand are thorough. Therefore, we can complete the work of our agendas in a reasonable amount of time. The meetings usually last about two hours. I think the staff is doing an excellent job and is to be commended, and I really want you to note that because it's, it's really been a pleasure, and I've worked with not that it wasn't a pleasure before, but it is just a, it's very dynamic working with this staff. I would, and I'd also like to know if you have any questions or concerns that I could relay back to the committee or like to keep the conversation open and going so we know everybody's viewpoints and um, just. So I'll go ahead and open that up to the council. Any, any comments for uh, Joan or Chuck or questions? Go ahead, Kelly. Just a comment. I've only attended one or two of your meetings, but I was very impressed with the, the way, the amount of background work and everything that was done for, we, I was, got to listen to the hearing on the Farnham side, and I really was very impressed by it. And I wish I'd been able to be in on a couple of the others, but uh, I, I think it's wonderful that this is getting going. It's very helpful with the people that have signs that might be out of compliance, but still might qualify as a historic sign. So I'm very pleased with the work that you folks have done. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Thank you very much for your time. Well, Joan, question that I have. Um, do we have any openings on your committee right now? Well, we do, actually. Uh, Rebecca Quant, thank you for asking. Rebecca Quant has just resigned because she has another job in Salem. So that will be open. And then uh, I don't know, two other places may be open. There's somebody coming, Corey, Sh Corey Schott, who's really, we are so lucky to have him. If you, he's part of that wayfaring group out in Sheridan. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, he is a, he's a gem and he's, um, he was filling in for the end of somebody's term, so he's coming. He's his his position is coming open, but I think he's reapplying. And also, my term expires, and I'm reapplying. So to say that they're open, no. <laughs> well, and, and that's what I'll tell. But the... we have one really open position, okay. and we're all looking for uh, good candidates. So if you have any suggestions. Mm -hmm. Please let Chuck know or me know or any anybody Heather know. And it's open now, and the applications I think are due by November twenty November twentieth. Um, Been in the paper, I think the yeah. last two. I, I didn't see today's paper, but the last two editions, I've I've seen that. Well, Joan, thank you for your leadership because you you're the long term person that has been on the committee. But I am so impressed when I look at those that are serving on this committee with their expertise, their background, and their their passion to do the things that need to happen. Um, again, so often. Um, you know, there's so much hard work put in, and it's not one of those glitzy, glamorous committees that we have, you know. I don't know that any of ours are, but <laughs> there are others that get a little more notoriety for what they're trying to accomplish. But yours is very focused, and I'd ask you to stay uh, uh, for... Uh, two presentations because I got I've got something that I'm going to present to the MDA that I think has some impact on your committee. But again, thank you, counselors. If you know of anyone that brings a passion for um, the historic nature of our community, this is a committee to be a part of. So again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that takes us to our consent agreement and for consideration tonight is the minutes of the March 14th, the uh, July 25th dinner and regular 
council meetings. Uh, I'll ask if there's, uh, if any counselor would request to have items moved from the consent agenda and be placed on the regular agenda. Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I so, I second. Okay. okay, so it's been moved by Council President Menke and seconded by uh, Councilors, uh, Councilor Jeffries. Um, all those in favor may signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying nay. <clears throat> the consent agenda passes unanimously. Uh, we're at this point this evening where we're going to have a work session and we've asked Recology to come in and come back and bring some information to us tonight. So, uh, Carl, if you'd uh, come up and anyone else you have with you and and uh, we'll uh, take the information that you've presented for us. So, welcome, Carl, and uh, it's good to have you in front of us again. Thank you. I saw on the agenda it said Dave Larmouth and I just wanted to <laughs> emphasize I'm not Dave yeah. Larmouth. I feel I should say thank you to uh, Mayor, City Council, and- Can you pull the mic a little closer? Ben, I yourself. should say welcome to, or thank you for the opportunity to be here to the Mayor, Council, and I feel like I should say royalty, the, <laughs> all, all the, the crowns up there. Um, knowing that there's a public hearing that's gonna happen in December, I'm actually probably gonna modify what I'm gonna say and keep my comments very brief. And if there's any questions, I'd be certainly more than happy to answer them, but you know, perhaps, uh, Public hearing will be the more adequate place for some of my comments. Um, but thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight in regards to the, uh, uh, the response that we sent to the city's inquiry for a proposal to an alternate disposal site. To confirm what we discussed in September, Ecology would propose headquarters landfill in Cowlitz County. It's a county-run landfill, well-run, well-managed facility. As presented in December, the cost implication is a 10% increase. Uh, which is detailed in the proposal that we submitted. Assuming we begin January 1, the rate change would be effective the same date. The transfer station, the construction is complete. I think the only thing we're waiting on to be operational is the results from the city inspection, which I believe was, may have been as recently as this, this week. Um, and so, you know, barring that, the, the facility would be ready to operate. I would also want to mention, barring any unforeseen circumstances, we are proposing that if the city elects to move forward with our proposal, that we would forego any other rate proposals or changes in calendar year 2018 that we'd normally bring in front of you. And again, we understand that means we'll bear some risk, but I think it's in good keeping with our relationship with the city, uh, where we will always do our best to demonstrate good partnership and, and value. Um, but short of that, I think everything else I'll hold off till public okay. hearing unless you had some questions for me. Well, I'll go ahead and open up for council if you would have any questions for, for Carl. Go ahead, Alan. Carl, uh, did I hear you right that you'd forego any uh, rate increases in 2018? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? I just had uh, one. Go um, ahead, This Kevin. is something we could probably bring up at the public hearing, but I just wanted to ask you to present it. Um, uh, when we, uh, when the Metro Council was entertaining a similar ordinance that, that, that I proposed back in April, they had a solid waste committee that brought forth the, like, um, the lifespan of these, of, of, the, of the landfills in the area. Um, so if, if Riverbend were looking at possibly closing soon because of the can't get expansion, I would be curious to know what cow, um, the Cowlitz one would be like, or any other neighboring ones that we might, that might, you might choose to go to. That we know that there are some longevity in those. You know, w one of the most interesting things uh, that I've learned coming to to Oregon four years ago, the amount of landfill capacity is pretty mind-boggling. There is probably 150 years of landfill capacity in Oregon when you begin looking at what's out east, Coffin Buttes, Cowlitz County, um, there's, there's not gonna be too much of a challenge of finding a place for it. Mm -hmm. Finding one that's responsible, well-managed, you know, th those are the things that we'll look for. And because that's our responsibility for the city to make sure it goes to a place, again, that's well-managed, well-run. And uh, the, the Cowlitz County facility Last I saw, I think it was 100 years. 
I won't hold myself and I'll make sure I have a correct answer for that when I come back. But I'm again, sure what, the, what they presented to Metro would be public records. You might want to just try to track that down. I'm sure there's people behind you that could help you find that too. Yeah. yeah. So that'd be interesting to see. Yep. But uh, I remember seeing Calvis County when they, when they presented to Metro. So that's why I was curious about that. Got it. Yep. I'll find out. Any other questions or comments? Wendy? Um, to piggyback on that, if you, and this again might be something to bring to public hearing, but the criteria that you used and how you selected the landfill would be something of interest to me. Just you mentioned a few of the things, but so we understand, you know, the quality of the management, things like that. If you could flesh that out. That Absolutely. And how you, how you came up with the percentage. And also there were already some, there was already some feedback from uh, Mr. Davis. Sorry, there's already some feedback from Mr. Davis. Um, is that information that you could would be able to provide at the? Uh, absolutely, I, I actually was prepared to present it, but I think again it, the format makes a whole lot more sense to just go ahead and wait until the the public hearing. But Thanks. absolutely, more than happy to address any concerns. Thanks, Remy. Um, that's what I was going to okay. say. Is just to to uh, address uh, the. Uh, the, the questions that uh, Mr. Davis brought up already. Absolutely. So any other comments or questions? Adam? Uh, Carl, what, uh, our next council meeting, provided we take action then, would one month give you guys ample time to have the, not just the transfer station, but the trailers and the tractors to, to be able to transport Jan 1? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you, Carl. We appreciate your preparation this evening, and we'll see you later. Well, I'm ready for that one, too, but thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, so with that presentation, I'm going to ask for a motion to schedule a public hearing on the matter of the recology proposal to redirect the um, disposal of solid waste and to accelerate the implementation of the franchise um, administration fee adjustment. So moved. Okay. Second. second. So it has been moved by Councillor Drabkin and seconded by uh, Councillor um, uh, Stassens. Uh, so we're not, we'll just take a vote on it and then we'll instruct uh, staff. So all in favor, please indicate with an aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. With that vote, uh, I think that gives a direction to city staff to bring uh, that back to us at our next council meeting in the form of a public hearing. And, um, and then we can have the discussions to move forward. Okay, thank you. Um, I have another presentation that I would like to make at this time. I came into the office this week and had a, a letter assigned by our governor. And I would like the MDA to uh, come back up here if they would. And uh, Chuck and Joan, if you'd come and sit, stand on the end, because I think this has some uh, implications to some of the good work that's been happening. Uh, <clears throat> not many are aware of what we've got, but this is a long-standing recognition that goes on. So this was dated October uh, the 25th, and it is uh, addressed to the Honorable Scott Hill of City of McMinnville. It says, Dear Mayor, on behalf of the citizens of Oregon, the state of Oregon, I congratulate the McMinnville Downtown Association for its recognition as a 2017 Main Street America um, accredited program. The rigors and the performance standards for the comprehensive commercial district revitalization in order to receive this designation makes it, uh, makes it a significant achievement. Revitalizing old and historic commercial districts helps build stronger communities. Your support of the economic development strategy which leverages new investment in your communities as well as the preservation of unique, the unique character of McMinnville. This program is an outstanding example of how commitment, uh, collaboration, inclusiveness, and civic engagement uh, can create a vibrant uh, community. The accreditation is a tribute not only to the community, but also to the citizens 
uh, who make McMinnville a wonderful place to live, work, play, and visit. Congratulations on this city's accomplishments. Sincerely, Kate Brown, Governor. And so I know we have been an accredited Main Street for many years. Uh, the McMinnville uh, Downtown Association was uh, one of the first organizations I uh, became involved in 25 years ago when I came into the community and have been very involved with uh, Livable Oregon and the Oregon Downtown Association, and I know from traveling the state that we're seen as one of the, from those that know, those that are on the street, uh, one of the best downtowns in Oregon. And so continue that work. And I look at the committee and say, you guys have been a good part of that too, because you've helped us over the years of being able to keep this historic uh, peace going and and working well so again we thought we'd frame that and you guys could put it in the office so again thank you and spending a little extra time but i thought it would be appropriate after the presentation that our committee made tonight so thank you Well, it's always, it's always fun to have presentations and proclamations and awards and recognition for the good things that are happening. But I can tell you, uh, especially from the governor, her coming out, and when she spent uh, uh, a, a good portion of the day uh, earlier this year, she was truly impressed with uh, our community and all the good things that are happening. Well, with that it takes us to our a resolution that we have this evening and that's going to be resolution number 2017-68 a resolution of the city of mcminnville oregon authorizing the execution and delivery of one or more leased uh, purchase loan or similar financing of uh, financing agreements and so we'll call on our uh, on our finance director uh, marcia if you would update us on this Yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor and Councilors. Uh, during our budget discussion last spring, uh, we talked about the di different options for acquiring the uh, police vehicles. And uh, as our chief had indicated that to maintain our police fleet and uh, really reduce the cost of repairs, that three vehicles would be needed. So we talked again about the different options and felt that the lease purchase option would be uh, a good way to acquire those cars. Uh, the um, lease purchase has a lot of flexibility. Uh, it allows us to keep our capital basically or um, spread the cost of the cars out over a period of time. The lease agreement is something that we haven't done, I think for quite a while here. Um, it's a, a kind of a hybrid uh, tax exempt structure. It's kind of like a loan and kind of like a lease. And it's uh, kind of like a loan because we have the title to the asset. Uh, it's kind of like a lease because it's a financing that is subject to termination. And so it's not legally debt because um, we could it, there's no multi-year obligation in the agreement. We could actually uh, buy out the lease at any point in time with the appropriate notification. So the uh, amount that we're financing with this agreement is about 137,000. Uh, the f five annual payments of about 30,360, which again, we did put in the budget for 1718. Um, because of the nature of this lease and the representations in the lease that this is a tax exempt um, instrument, we did have our, our bond council review the lease agreement and um, they actually drafted the resolu resolution that's before you tonight. Uh, and that resolution is required for us to execute the lease. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. So we'll open it up for questions and for uh, council discussion. Any questions? Go ahead, um, Kevin, and then uh, Adam. Um, were we precluded from shopping around on 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 lender or to borrowers? Or I guess lenders for for this uh, lease agreement. Uh, the f 
the 5.45 rate seems awfully high for the credit rating that we have. Well, and I did actually um, talk to a couple of other places, one in particular, and um, the difference in the cost of this lease was that um, there was just the one fee. Um, the um, I don't recall the other company that I spoke to, but they had an annual fee. So this um, effective rate actually is lower uh, than the other um, that we looked at. The cars are purchased on state bid, um, mm. and we it's been um, uh, really convenient, I guess, to work with Ford Credit because we are buying the cars from the Ford dealership. I mean, I don't know if well, David or, or uh, Matt has anything to add to that. I mean, the consumer rates are much lower than that. It just blows my mind. I mean, on points are like two something. So it's just. Well, I, I, th I think the consumer rates that we see are incentives to sell cars that are built into the price of the car. That's if you go to a, a credit union or a bank, not, okay. not, through the, not through the dealership. It's much cheaper. Okay. Um, life expectancy of these three units, so it looks like we're doing five years of payments, so we're thinking we get at least five years of use out of them. Depends uh, if we have another winter like last time. Right? Yeah, uh, so we're getting uh, between five and six years out of the car. So I'd anticipate at the end of the lease, uh, we pay a dollar for the vehicle, own it outright, and we can either use it into that sixth year, which we're generally, they're coming out of service, um, and then uh, what we generally historically have done is then um, uh, sell them uh, through a state auction site or something like that to or to another local municipality. And then, uh, Marsha, you said it went through state bids. So is that what dictates what dealership you guys are working with opposed to what you said the cars were through state bid process? So is, is that how we ended up with Landmark instead of working with like Newberg or Chuck Holman? That, that's correct. So Landmark. Is a, is a state bid, uh, won the state bid, so they've got the, the vehicles at that state bid price. That's why we went through them. Okay. Um, and then I know ever since the Crown Vic was retired, it's kind of been trial and error with what vehicles departments are going with. Are these Explorers? Or are they Fusion? These uh, these three are Explorers. Two are Patrol, and one is set up uh, for canine. Um, and uh, the price within the lease also includes the equipment. So that's uh, for the full, uh, it's the full build out of these vehicles. So um, uh, we went with the Explorer. Uh, they're bigger. Uh, the Chargers are smaller uh, inside. Uh, so the, the Explorers do have a little bit more room. And I think you've probably seen locally and even regionally, uh, many police officers or police departments are going towards that, uh, the, the Explorer, which are a little bit more functional. And have they eradicated that idling issue they came out yes, with? Yes. Uh, so uh, there was some idle issues with the, uh, um, uh, exhaust and stuff. Yeah, th th those have been uh, taken care of through recall. And with that canine unit, are we adding a canine? Officer? No. no. So we've got a canine unit that's uh, ready to, uh, vehicle itself is ready to uh, be pulled from the road uh, due to high mileage. Thank you. How do you determine the um, life expectancy of a vehicle? You, you just referenced mileage as one marker. Yeah, we're usually, uh, so the police vehicles, um, they have, uh, we're generally running them up to 100 and 110,000 uh, miles. Maybe some have 120,000 miles on them. Uh, those vehicles also include idle time because oftentimes police uh, vehicles are, are, um, are, are sitting parked uh, with the vehicle uh, engine running. Um, but in general, uh, under the benchmark within our, uh, our, our, uh, our profession is about five years of the service life with about 100 to 120 miles per hour. Some of the smaller agencies you'll see maybe Amity, they're running those uh, ex uh, well into probably probably 150, 160. I will say that the costs of maintaining those vehicles, that's where it's really negligible because we're at some point uh, replacing transmissions and things like that, which are very expensive for us. So um, with hopefully with keeping our, our, our fleet fresh, uh, we're reducing the, the maintenance costs, you know, having to replace those, those high cost items such as transmissions. <clears throat> Any other questions? Does Discussion? Does this have any warranty? I'm sorry? Does this lease leases have any sort of warranty, or they're just like buying a car outright where? I think three or 36,000. Uh, like, uh, hmm? yeah. A standard warranty. Any other discussion? 
Okay. I'll ask for a motion to approve resolution 2017-68. So moved. Second. Then moved by uh, um, uh, Councilor Garvin and seconded by Council President Mankey. Um, so I'll ask all those in favor to indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed by saying nay. This resolution has passed unanimously. This takes us to our only ordinance this evening, and um, we now will uh, consider the matter of ordinance 5041. Does any councilor object to having the ordinance read by title only? Hearing none, will the uh, city attorney please read the ordinance by title only? Yes, Mr. Mayor. This is ordinance number 5041, an ordinance amending the McMinnville Municipal Code, chapter 2.32, specific to the McMinnville Urban Area Planning Commission and repealing and replacing ordinance 3688. Thank you, David. Uh, we'll call on our planning director, Heather, if you would uh, uh, present the material to us tonight. Yes, so good evening, Mayor and City Councilors. Um, so although I think all of our committees are glamorous and glitzy, this is probably the glitziest of them all. Actually, maybe the grittiest of them all. This, this is our, the Planning Commission is a very hardworking committee of volunteers serving the city. And I think it's tonight we have an ordinance that's amending their enabling code. I'm going to walk through it because I also think it's important for people to realize all the work that they are doing and how the committee is comprised and serves the community. It is amending the McMinnville City Code. We are at this point in time trying to put all the committees into Title II of the McMinnville City Code so that we have some sort of standardization for them. Um, we will, um, for the code, we have a purpose, we have responsibilities and power. We talk about what the membership is for the commission. We talk about how the officers are elected and how they serve. Um, we talk about the, the, how the meetings are conducted, what actually constitutes a quorum, because that will often come up as a question. Uh, we talk about what expenses can be reimbursed and then some special provisions and staff support for the, for the commission. So the purpose of the Planning Commission actually serves two roles, and they're a little bit different than the other city committees in that they're advisory to city council like all of the other committees are, but they're also a quasi-judicial decision-making body. So that means they're making legal land use decisions for the city of McMinnville. However, you know, outside of those two tools in terms of how they serve, I think it's important to recognize that really what they're doing is they're, they're advising and making decisions about planning for growth and development uh, in an orderly fashion with adequate resources. So they're looking at how things are growing, how things are developing, making sure that they're happening in an orderly fashion but are also affordable for the community moving forward in terms of financing the infrastructure. Uh, they're looking at adequate resources for housing, for business, for industry, for transportation, recreation, culture, comfort, health, and welfare. And they're doing it in such a way so that residents and businesses can enjoy a high quality of life. So lots of different um, nuances that they're looking at and studying on, on a monthly basis as they work through their processes. The responsibilities and powers, what's been amended in the code that's in front of you today is we actually are taking language from the old code, but we're also bringing a new language from uh, Oregon Revised Statute 227, which actually governs how planning commissions serve municipalities. Um, and so direct language from that code is that planning commissions are looking at streets, sidewalks, bike paths, boulevards, relief of traffic congestion, congestion, betterment of housing and sanitation conditions. So that's the public facility planning. They're looking at establishment of zones with development standards, plans and regulations for growth, development and beautification of the city, promotion, development and regulation of industrial and economic needs of the community, and then studying the needs of local industries. Those are all the responsibilities charged to them through the ORSs for the state of Oregon. So lots of different nuances again in terms of how they're serving the community. There are also, if you recall, we have revised the comprehensive plan 
um, and identified that the Planning Commission would serve as a citizen involvement committee. And so that is also one of their responsibilities and powers. And if you'll note the picture in there, we often have packed, this room is often packed for some of our meetings at the Planning Commission because of the public hearing processes that they are uh, administering and managing and inviting the public to come and comment on what they're doing. Oh, and I should say that they will be putting together a, so next year we'll be working with them and they'll be putting together a citizen involvement plan for the city council to consider. And then they'll be re evaluating that every year at their October meeting and bringing rec any recommendations to you in terms of amending that plan and uh, what's working and what's not working for our outreach. In terms of the membership, they're one of our larger committees. There's, it's nine members, so they filled the dais. Uh, two members are uh, from each ward, and then they have three at-large members, and, one at and those at-large members could include members that reside in the urban growth boundary, so not in the city limits, which is also different. Um, it's meant to represent a cross-section of our citizens. Uh, so right now we're getting to some diversity on the commission, which is nice to see. We have uh, age diversity. We also have gender diversity, and they're, and they're all bringing different uh, perspectives to the table as they're working through some of their processes, so that's nice. Um, there are, they are elected for, for elected. They're appointed for four-year terms. Um, they're allowed to serve for three full terms, and we are recommending that there be an ex officio youth as part of the membership program. In terms of officers, these are our two officers that we have today. Our chair is Roger Hall. Uh, he used to be the mayor of Milwaukee, so he's very familiar with how to run a meeting. And then Zach Geary is our vice chair and being mentored by uh, Roger. The code in front of you also talks about the need to provide a secretary for the planning commission. So that is a role staff plays. It is also something that we use an outside vendor to help us uh, in terms of transcribing our audio recordings into minutes. Um, it also, the code also uh, provides the need at, the also provides the need for the city to provide office support. So that's the planning department for the planning commission. And then the annual report to city council, which is a new provision. Um, all the other provisions existed in the older code, but now we're recommending an annual report to city council so that there's an opportunity for you as a body that's appointing the planning commission who's serving you to have a discussion about one, what have they, they've accomplished over the year because they are doing a lot of work, what their plans and recommendations are for the next year, and then any direction that you want to provide to them as well. So this is an annual report. I, I hope in the future that eventually we will have some joint meetings between city council and planning commission as we start to dive into some um, grittier discussions uh, in terms of long-term planning moving forward. So that's the ordinance that's in front of you. They are working hard. Uh, they typically meet, they meet once a month, the third Thursday of every month. They have a work session that starts at 5.30. Their business meeting starts at 6.30. And they typically are here till about 9.30. So they're, they're having four hour meetings. It could go longer depending on what the public hearing process is because they are committed to hearing every citizen that comes out for a public hearing to, to talk about one of the land use applications that's in front of them. Uh, this Thursday, their work session is going to be, uh, we're bringing in a consultant to talk about traffic impact analysis. It's something that we require on some of our larger land use applications. We've had a lot of questions from planning commission about it, so they're reading their packets. That's good. Um, and we've also had a lot of questions from the public. So we're going to start doing, um, setting up our planning commission meetings where uh, we're going to have educational forums for both planning commission and invite the public to those. And this traffic impact analysis study is the first one of those. We're also doing a lot of work sessions on some sort of legislative, proactive, strategic planning. You've seen some of that come forward where we're recommending amendments proactively to the code. And then they have their business meetings with the land use application. So they're trying to work through a three-legged stool in terms of their role serving you and the community. Are there any questions? I'll turn. Any questions of Heather? I know we have a number of individuals that have served on the planning uh, commission at the dais, but I'd just like to say thank you for all the work you've put in and the recommendations you've made to move forward. 
well, I'll pass it on to the Planning Commission because they've put a lot of work into this. Very, They're a very thoughtful group, very respectful of each other, and uh, spent two work sessions working through this and also sending staff back and forth some um, emails and dialogue about it as well as we work through it. So, Just thank you. a comment. Uh, although counselors are not encouraged to go to the actual commission meetings, <coughs> the work sessions are fascinating, and you get a lot of good insight into information. So... I would strongly encourage people to go to it. I've been going to a few, and I really enjoyed it. It's a lot of fun, and the and the, uh, the commission itself is an interesting and very with it group. <laughs> Wendy? Um, I'd just like to say that I love the direction that you're going and they're going with regards to being really proactive and um, having a real plan. And I, what we see coming to us is great work so please do pass that on to the current planning commission i know they're working really hard and it shows it's going to really benefit the community into the future so thank you alan i uh, just echo what wendy said uh it's it's good to see some ratcheting up so to speak changing and uh, adjusting to growth and growth needs in the community and keeping current with how things should be. I don't have any real questions on any of the uh, aspects of the ordinance. You answered most of, the, most of those for me during our dinner meeting. But it's just good to see uh, just a general upgrade in city uh, commissions across the board. And the planning commission is, as I feel, uh, right at the forefront of a lot of things and so it's really important and uh, so I appreciate the process we're going through and the upgrade and uh, I think it'll be beneficial in the years to come so, thank you thank you council uh, so I'll ask for a motion to pass ordinance number 5041 to a second reading I so move Again. It has been um, a move by Council President Mankey <coughs> and seconded by Councillor Rudin. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any uh, sig uh, opposed signify by saying nay. <coughs> and so this uh, motion passes unanimously. <coughs> Ordinance 5041 uh, passes and it's first reading unanimously. We will now ask the city attorney to read the ordinance again by title only. This is ordinance number 5041, an ordinance amending the McMinnville City Code, chapter 2.32, specific to the McMinnville Urban Area Planning Commission, repealing and replacing ordinance number 3688. Thank you, David. I will now ask for a motion to adopt ordinance number 5041. So moved. Second. second. And, and then a second. So it's been moved by... Um, uh, Councillor Stassens and uh, seconded by um, Councillor Drabkin uh, to, um, and so we'll ask the city recorder to pull the council. Councillor Drabkin? Aye. Councillor Garvin? Aye. Councillor Jeffries? Aye. Councillor Stassens? Aye. Councillor Rudin? Aye. Council President Minky? Aye. Ordinance number 5041 is adopted by a vote of six to six. Um, so thank you on that. Uh, that takes us to advice and information this evening. Uh, reports from counselors on committee and board assignments. And Heather, thank you. Uh, Adam, why don't we start with you and we'll just head down this way. Uh, Wycom, we've officially signed the contract with Tritech for our new new uh, infrastructure update, which I believe is our first one since Wycom moved to the new facility. And uh, so that's exciting. We don't have a project manager yet, but Tritech's identifying that, and hopefully by our next Wycom meeting, we'll know who that individual is. Um, so nothing too crazy going on there, other than when that's finally active we should have text to 911 capability. Um, and then our downtown safety task force has met twice and Susan and Matt have been doing a great job with that. Um, our packets are very informative. I think you've been there, Mr. Mayor and Kelly, and 
think there's been good discussion. We do get maybe sidetracked a little bit with wanting to make resolutions before priorities, but um, I think overall it's going well and everybody's bought in and everybody's moving forward in the same direction. So I don't think anybody's off on their own little agenda. Thank you, Adam, for that report. Um, Kevin? Okay, this time. Okay. Kelly? I think I've reported on most of the current committee work. The only thing I guess I would comment on, and certainly is by no means a done deal, but, you know, the continuing conversation about a uh, possible teen center uh, came up at the homeless meeting yesterday. And it's, uh, we're still in the information gathering stage, but evidently why, um, YCAP is looking at a uh, operational type of uh, grant, and they should have some information for us within the next month or two on that. And if they do get that, then we probably will look at going forward and seeing if we can get assistance from the community to put this together. Thank you. Wendy? Uh, so the Urban Renewal Advisory Committee was canceled this uh, the beginning of this month because we are going to have a meeting with Sarah Architects on the 28th uh, to look at a streetscape uh, um, standards that we I talked about previously that we're trying to come up with some street streetscape standards for that area. So I'll have more to report next meeting from that meeting. Thank you. Remy? Uh, we had a tremendous uh, meeting with um, for our last affordable housing task force meeting. Last month we um, were able to, through YCAP, uh, uh, have our meeting time moved over to, the, uh, to YCAP where um, Oregon Housing and Community Services came in um, and uh, spoke with, uh, really had an open discussion um, and not just with our committee, but the county was also present. Um, we had uh, multiple state representatives there. Um, we had service providers, um, community members, uh, really just a great cross-section of, of, of people that are all working on um, housing and uh, homelessness in the state. Um, so that was not only informative, but um, I, well, I think it was informative in, in both directions. They um, seemed to take away a lot, and, and, and certainly um, I know I took away a lot from it as well, um, and um, attempting to, to continue that dialogue. Um, for our next affordable housing task force meeting, it would normally be uh, the, when, uh, the third Wednesday of the month, fourth Wednesday, third Wednesday of the month, fourth Wednesday of the month, but the fourth Wednesday of this month, the time that would normally be scheduled this month is the day before Thanksgiving, so we're delaying it uh, to the following week, and I'm sure that'll be available on the city website for those who would like to attend. And then, um, as Kelly mentioned, we had the subcommittee meeting on um, uh, housing as it relates to homelessness uh, for the city of McMinnville, and I... Um, Kelly mentioned the work that's being done on um, uh, w with bringing a youth outreach program. Um, we also heard updates on um, uh, uh, action plans for vehicular homeless, which Chief Scales is working on tremendously, uh, quite a bit, and um, and on uh, senior women um, uh, and, and heard uh, action plan on that uh, update on that as well. Um, and that I understand is, um, is, is moving quite a bit. And just so the community knows, I think that there's a, a great piece of information to share, um, as it relates to that committee, that's not necessarily about the specific work in it, but that, um, a VISTA volunteer has been appointed to health and human services and the county and uh, the, the, the person who, who has her charge with that, um, Lindsay Manfrin, who's co-chairing this subcommittee, um, has uh, basically made that VISTA volunteer available full-time to work on homelessness um, in the city. And so that volunteer is working a, a lot with Heather 
um, and then with each of these subcommittees to give them a lot of form. And we've seen a real um, boost uh, in productivity with having that um, designated resource. So I just think that's a, a really positive um, really positive thing to for, that supports all the work that's being done um, in those committees. Thank you, Remy. A lot of good things happening. Alan, uh, the uh, airport commission met um, recently and a couple things that really came up that we talked about and, uh, and one of them we approved was a, a non-aviation event that was similar to the one held in 2016, a car race with a lot of cool cars and they're gonna they want to uh, propose that again for 2018 out there on the runway so that was discussed and we approved uh, for them to move forward on a more explicit plan so that we could uh, take a look at that so uh, there was concern about the group and I've forgotten the name of them but uh, with our runway the the new construction of the runway is uh, decrease the width of it and there was some talk about that but they say that's plenty of room uh, for their their car racing to go on also <clears throat> connect aviation gave a report uh, concerning their financial adverse effect of the delay of the airstrip getting done and so we went over that with them and heard their um, analysis of how the, the financial impact has been negative towards them and it's hurt them financially. So we've encouraged uh, uh, staff to try and get some remuneration or something to, to connect, uh, just to encourage them to see if there's any way that could come to pass and make them whole on it if possible. So that's about it. Okay. Thank you, Alan. Uh, just a couple of things I have is, uh, I think it was yesterday we had a wayfaring, a wayfinding uh, committee meeting that's a, a part of the Visit McMinnville. Um, and we're to the point where we have really kind of put uh, uh, a stamp on the design and what we want it to look like. Um, we made some decisions with colors um, over the last two months we've really come up with with design work we talked a little bit about monument uh, in uh, sidewalks to help a part of that um, so good things happening we're seeing uh, end results and I think the next thing that we'll probably be seeing shortly will be instead of, of uh, the um, uh, <coughs> cardboard mock-ups we'll probably see the real uh, the real signs to see what they would look like. Then the task comes back to take it back to um, uh, visit McMinnville and then them to coordinate and then bring some of that to the council. Uh, again, this is design. This is kind of a policy of how signs would be used, uh, the connectivity of all of that. And then the big piece then would be, um, you know, how we're going to how we're going to implement that and how we're going to be able to, to cover some of the cost of doing some of those things. But we're looking at kiosks that are, are very user-friendly. They're going to help us uh, to locations. We talked a little bit about the locations those kiosks would be and the impact that those kiosks would have. So more to come. Um, again, if any have uh, a desire to uh, be a part of just listening to it's about an hour to a two hour discussion that we do feel free to come to any of the meetings um, uh, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, Kim Carr his last day is tomorrow we had a luncheon for him today and sent him off with all of our thanks and the good work that he's done that was a that was a, a, a great event and so we recognize matter of fact you may or may not know but today is a uh, a Kim Carr Day in the city of McMinnville. We did a proclamation, and he was pretty tickled with that. Um, uh, we, just to let you know, the Yamhill County Emergency Management, we are meeting now every other month, and so this month uh, we did not have a meeting, so it will be held 
in uh, in December, our next meeting. And then lastly, Thursday night is going to be our Yam Hill count, City and County dinner for those that have signed out out at Spirit Mountain. Uh, so let's move over to... Um, uh, to uh, our department heads. Uh, Matt? Uh, real quickly, uh, I think our next council session will have our first check-in with the Downtown Safety Task Force. I think uh, you'll be pleasantly surprised that we made some headway and we've got a plan of it, uh, uh, moving forward and grabbing the, the data that the council's requested. So that that's actually exciting that we're moving um, in that direction. And secondly, um, we've... Uh, got a couple lateral hires i think that's important to tell you uh people that are in backgrounds right now with us that is uh, helping us shore up vacancies that we've got uh allow us to get people on the road much quicker than uh, the, the academy and then finally uh the, the parking code enforcement uh position that you authorized uh, a couple of months ago uh, those are still taking applications i believe we close on the 24th uh, and then we'll be in uh, application reviews and then into interviews so uh, progress we made and then finally uh this uh this last week i announced that we will be promoting a sergeant to fill uh, captain sandoval's vacancy she was a sergeant so uh that will be an internal recruitment that uh, uh we've got a, a number of uh employees that are ready to take that step so lots of stuff thank you matt marcia uh yes actually i went to uh uh, apologize to Councillor Jeffries because I feel like I didn't answer his question early <laughs> about the um, uh, the leases for the cars. I think I misunderstood your question, but the um, these municipal leases are a little bit different because there is a non-appropriations clause in the lease. So if for some reason two years into the lease the city would not appropriate the funds to pay the remaining installment payments on the lease. The uh, city could actually uh, terminate the lease without any penalty or without any uh, further obligation. So um, it's a little bit different than, um, you know, me going down to the local dealership and buying a car. So I just wanted to point out that uh, the structure of these leases is a little bit, bit different because of the non-appropriations clauses. Yeah, my question is more about the the rate itself, um, if if I were to go buy a car, I wouldn't get the loan from the dealership. I would get the loan from from a bank that was most competitive that would offer me the auto loan. Um, and so that's what I was getting at, was that the rate for the loan, for the lease was, seemed higher than, um, cause it's kind of a, it's kind of a loan and it's, it's kind of a lease and it's kind of a loan. Um, and so that was, that was kind of, the, the jump where, where my question was, was leading to was, were there more competitive uh, lenders uh, for that for that purchase? And I guess what I'm saying is I don't think that because of the non-appropriations clause in the lease, um, it wouldn't be like going to a bank yeah. and and uh, um, uh, the, offering the same kind of lease. The, the example is that, that two years into into your loan with the bank, you couldn't go to them and say. Here's the keys to the car. You can you can have it. I'm not going to make the last three years of payments. You could, but you, right? <laughs> but would. they'd come after you. <laughs> there, there, there may be some recourse. Yeah. Um, and in yeah. in this case, it, yeah. That makes sense. It's not a straightforward loan. It's different. Right. Correct. Right. And so there aren't as many. I mean, there aren't as many options like for where you can go to get a loan like that, basically. Right. Right. And, and, and the rate's going to be higher because you can do that. Yeah. And, and Marcia, you, you did explore other options for that. And given the, the, the combination of annual fees plus interest, annual interest, this one ended up being the best yeah. value mm -hmm. for the city, lowest cost for the city. Can I ask a clarifying question also? What can you tell me for a product like this that the city could get that would be a loan? Why is why was the lease slash loan option more viable than just a straight loan for us as the city? There, I would assume that we looked at those just a loan as well. Well, and there again, I think it goes back to the the structure, the nature of this, in that we could. Um, because this council can't commit future councils to uh, make these debt service payments, or uh, I'm sorry, these lease payments, 
the um, non-appropriations clause that is in all of the, uh, like the lease agreements for our copiers, uh, copier printers that we lease have that non-appropriations clause. The loans, the loans don't have that. Correct. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Um, Heather? Melissa? And David? I get you for exact session, so okay. I'll wait. <laughs> Jeff? A couple of things. Uh, we're seeking consultant services to assist in the strategic planning process. We're reviewing um, proposals from four consultants to assist with an economic strategy, representatives of the chamber, the downtown association, Visit McMinnville, MEDP, uh, and Heather have joined together to uh, advise me on a consultant. Uh, we've reviewed four proposals. We've uh, eliminated two of those and we'll be interviewing two consultant candidates tomorrow and should have a decision on that consultant selection relatively soon. Uh, we've also submitted a request for proposals for the overall strategic planning process. We've received uh, five proposals and I've convened a committee. I asked the mayor uh, to serve on the committee. He invited Councillor Stassens uh, along with Heather. We've also invited Cassie Solars and Walt Gowell to assist in reviewing those proposals. Um, that's the homework. And we'll be meeting on Friday to review the results of those proposals. And then finally, the most important thing to say is while Marcia has been a fine grandmother for quite some time, uh, she's officially a great grandmother now. And we should congratulate her on the public record. Aww. Thank you. Thank you for mentioning that. It was a, it was a big day in my, in She's my family. She's a very young great grandmother. Thank though. you. Okay. And it's been a very long day, yeah. I might add. Thank you, Jeff. Well, as uh, David indicated, we are um, we're going to be headed into executive session uh, to uh, conduct deliberations with persons uh, designated to carry out labor negotiations and to consult with legal counsel concerning uh, legal rights and duties regarding current litigation or pretend, uh, potential litigation. So at this point, I will close uh, the uh, city council. And uh, council will move uh, into the conference.